Straggling back to Washington for the Republican Revolution's death vigil, the 2006 election's surviving GOP members bid anguish goodbyes to defeated friends and struggled to make sense of it all. Dazed and confused, some members managed to grasp the reality of their newly minted minority, while some still grapple with it. Out of this former group, a distinct vision has emerged concerning how House Republicans can revitalize and redeem themselves in the estimation of their fellow Americans. Restoration Republicans are best considered Reagan's grandchildren. Like their Reagan Democratic parents, Restoration Republicans were attracted to our party by the intellectual, cultural, and moral components, as well as the proven practical benefits of philosophical conservatism. Transcending talking points and political cant, these Restoration Republicans are devoted to restoring hum the human soul's centrality to public policy decisions and focusing these policies on preserving and perpetuating the permanent things of our evanescent earthly existence, which surpass all politics in importance. The enduring ideals of Restoration Republicans are succinctly enumerated by Russell Kirk in his book, The Politics of Prudence. One, conservatives believe that there exists an enduring moral order. Two, conservatives adhere to custom, convention, and continuity. Three, conservatives believe in what may be called the principle of prescription, that is, of things established by immemorial usage. Four, conservatives are guided by the principle of prudence. Five, conservatives pay attention to the principle of variety. Six, conservatives are chastened by their principle of imperfectibility. Seven, conservatives are persuaded that freedom and property are closely linked. Eight, conservatives uphold voluntary community, quite as they oppose involuntary collectivism. Nine, the conservative perceives the need for prudent restraints upon power and upon human passion. And finally, ten, the thinking conservative understands that permanence and change must be recognized and reconciled in a vigorous society. Given how the cashocracy repeatedly violated these principles during its descent into oblivion, and how the Democrats' 2006 rallying cry was change, this tenth ideal merits deeper contemplation. For to understand it fully is to fully understand why Restoration Republicans, who are convinced we live amidst a crucible of liberty, proclaim our minority must emulate and implement the philosophical conservatism of Ronald Reagan and the fiery integrity of Theodore Roosevelt in the cause of empowering Americans and strengthening their eternal institutions of faith, family, community, and country. Again, I quote from Kirk, Therefore, the intelligent conservative endeavors to reconcile the claims of permanence and the claims of progression. He or she thinks that the liberal and the radical, blind to the just claims of permanence, would endanger the heritage bequeathed to us in an endeavor to hurry us into some dubious terrestrial paradise. The conservative, in short, favors reasoned and temperate progress. He or she is opposed to the cult of progress, whose votaries believe that everything new is necessarily superior to everything old. Change is essential to the body social, the conservative reasons, just as it is essential to the human body. A body that has ceased to renew itself has begun to die. But if that body is to be vigorous, the change must occur in a regular manner, harmonizing with the form and nature of that body. Otherwise, change produces a monstrous growth, a cancer which devours its host. The conservative takes care that nothing in a society should ever be wholly old and that nothing should ever be wholly new. This is the means of the conservation of a nation, quite as it is the means of conservation of a living organism. Just how much change a society requires and what sort of change depend upon the circumstances of an age and a nation. Kirk's words compelled Restoration Republicans to empathetically assess our nation's age and circumstances and ponder the direction and scope of the changes our American community requires. In making these determinations, Restoration Republicans draw parallels between the and inspiration from America's greatest generation. Our greatest generation faced and surmounted a quartet of generational challenges born of industrialization, economic, social, and political upheavals a second world war against abject evil, the rise of the Soviet superstate as a strategic threat and rival model of governance, and the civil rights movement's moral struggle to equally ensure the God-given and constitutionally recognized rights of all Americans. Today, our generation of Americans must confront and transcend a quartet of generational challenges born of globalization, economic, social, and political upheavals, 
a third world war against abject evil, the rise of the communist Chinese superstate as a strategic threat and rival model of governance, and moral relativism's erosion of our nation's foundational self-evident truths. The critical difference between the challenges conquered by the greatest generation and the challenges confronting our generation of Americans is this. They face their challenges consecutively. We face our challenges simultaneously. In response to these generational challenges to our free republic restoration, Republicans have drawn upon the roots of their philosophical conservatism to affirm the truth. America does not exist to emulate others. America exists to inspire the world and to advance the policy paradigm of American excellence which rests upon a foundation of liberty and the four cornerstones of sovereignty, security, prosperity, and verities. Individually and collectively, American excellence's foundation and four cornerstones are reinforced by these policy principles. Our liberty is granted not by the pen of a government bureaucrat, but is authored by the hand of Almighty God. Our sovereignty rests not in our soil, but in our souls. Our security is guaranteed not by the thin hopes of appeasement, but by the moral and physical courage of our troops defending us in hours of maximum danger. Our prosperity is produced not by the tax hikes and spending sprees of politicians, but by, by, but by the innovation and perspiration of free people engaged in free enterprise. Our cherished truths and communal virtues are preserved and observed not by a coerced political correctness, but by our reverend citizenry's voluntary celebration of the culture of life. Restoration Republicans conclude, therefore, we must be champions of American freedom in, challenging new, in this challenging new millennium to keep our America a community of destiny, inspired and guided by the virtuous genius of our free people, and forever blessed by the unfathomable grace of God. It will not be easy, given the root public policy question of our times. In the age of industrialization, President Theodore Roosevelt empathized with Americans' feelings of powerlessness in the face of economic, social, and political forces radically altering or terminating their traditional, typically agrarian lives. Writing years later in his book, A Humane Economy, the economist William Ropke, Wilhelm Ropke examined the impacts upon human beings by these forces, which he collectively termed mass society. I quote, the disintegration of the social structure generates a profound upheaval in the outward conditions of each individual's life, thought, and work. Independence is smothered. Men are uprooted and taken out of the close woven social texture in which they were secure. True communities are broken up in favor of more universal but impersonable collectivities in which the individual is no longer a person in his own right. The inward, spontaneous social fabric is loosened in favor of mechanical, soulless organization with its outward compulsion. All individuality is reduced to one plane of uniform normality. The area of individual action, decision, and responsibility shrinks in favor of collective planning and decision. The whole of life becomes uniform and standard mass life, ever more subject to party politics, nationalization, and socialization. In that industrial epoch, the root policy question was how to protect Americans' traditional rights to order, justice, and freedom from being usurped by corporate or governmental centralization. Aware of this quandary, TR responded by taming an emergent capitalist oligarchy which considered itself above the laws, and thereby soothing the economic, social, and political anxieties of urban industrial workers which threatened the stability of our free republic. Over time, from TR's seminal efforts arose the industrial welfare state, which in a tenuous detente divided solutions to Americans' economic and social upheavals between and within both centralized corporations and government. In this age of globalization, however, while Americans are vexed by their seeming inability to influence the potent economic, social, and political forces radically reshaping their lives, American corporations are busy decentralizing into virtual corporations, reliant upon the outsourcing of jobs to other nations to obtain lower labor costs and evade cumbersome domestic laws and regulations. Such rootless capital being sent around the world in a keystroke to more, quote, competitive markets, end quote, has cost Americans their livelihoods, reduced their wages and employer-provided benefits, diminished their union's memberships, eclipsed their optimism regarding our economy's continued vitality, and in cases of extreme economic distress and angst, destroyed their marriages and dreams for their children.